In this video, you will learn some of the most important rules for correct comma usage. Whenever I teach commas, I think about Holden Caulfield. If you haven't read The Catcher in the Rye, Holden Caulfield is the narrator. And without going too much into the story, he is not doing well in school, but he's pretty good at English. He's good at writing. And his roommate is getting ready for a date. And the roommate asks Holden to write an essay for him. And the roommate says, you know, be sure it's not too good. You know, like, don't make, make sure you don't put all the commas in the right place. And here's Holden's response. That's something else that gives me a royal pain. I mean, if you're good at writing compositions and somebody starts talking about commas, Stradlater was always doing that. He wanted you to think that the only reason he was lousy at writing compositions was because he stuck all the commas in the wrong place. And I love this quote for several reasons. First of all, I just think it really helps to characterize Holden. But I also think it really shows something Holden understands about writing that a lot of people really don't. Um, I've had many students come through who think they've lost all their points for the commas being in the wrong place. And that's just not ever true, at least in my classes. Commas are important, but they are certainly not what makes or breaks good writing. However, when you know the comma rules, you have more control over your writing and you're able to write more clearly for your readers, which is, of course, the goal of all good writing. So I think it's useful to think about commas in this way. Commas are there to help writers communicate complex ideas clearly. And this reminds me of another quote. This is from an essay by Pico Iyer called In Praise of the Humble Comma, which is definitely worth reading if you are unfamiliar with it. Here's a small excerpt. Just notice how it sounds and then come back and look at how the punctuation is operating. A world that has only periods is a world without inflections. It is a world without shade. It has a music without sharps and flats. It is a martial music. It has a jackboot rhythm. Words cannot bend and curve. A comma, by comparison, catches the gentle drift of the mind in thought, turning in on itself and back on itself, reversing, doubling, and returning along the course of its own sweet river music. So when we go back and look at this, you know, the first time we saw it or heard it, we could probably hear that that last sentence, which is only one sentence, is really long and melodic. The first several sentences, in fact, it's one, two, three, four, five, six sentences, are short and choppy. So of course the writer constructs it this way to illustrate his point about the way that commas kind of give us flexibility. I think it's also useful to look at the sentence in which he includes commas and to imagine the sentence without commas. So let's actually do that. Here it is, just that last sentence without the commas. So try reading it out loud. And the fact that you just heard it, it's probably going to help you get through it. And just notice if it feels any different to read without the commas. So it's worth thinking about what you noticed. Certainly you probably stumbled a little bit with the itself reversing, redoubling, because that's not a construction that we would be used to. You probably got through it okay and got the main idea, but when we think about the previous sentence with the commas intact, there is, it's, not, it's clearer and it is more musical because the commas help us process what's happening and provide a flow to the sentence. So the first misconception I want to clear up is that commas equal pause. So this is what I hear from students all the time. Don't I just use a comma when I want the reader to pause? And the answer is not exactly. That's a useful way to help younger writers think about comma usage. But if you're in high school and you want to go to college, you really need to think about how commas really aren't just for a pause. They serve more specific purposes. Yes, they can be for pausing, but that does not mean you stick a comma in anywhere you want to pause. And it also doesn't mean that just because you don't want to pause that you don't use a comma. The comma rules are there to help 
guide readers clearly through the writing, which is why it's important to follow the conventions. That's what conventions really are, the set of rules that everybody kind of agrees upon, this is how it's going to be done. And although those things can change over time, and while comma rules are some of the most unstandardized rules in the English language, if we look at what commas are really kind of there to do, it makes logical sense. So let's look at a fun example. This is actually kind of a, it's a meme, a t-shirt, it's a joke. Let's eat, Grandma. So in the sentence, we're talking to Grandma. It's dinner time. Come on, Grandma, come have dinner. In the sentence without the comma, let's eat, Grandma. There's no comma, which makes Grandma the direct object, which means they're going to eat Grandma, or Grandma is going to be our main course for dinner. And the tagline is use commas, commas save lives. And while this is really clever, I think it more importantly shows how commas are more than just a pause. We could pause there or not, but when we see it written, it becomes clear that the pause isn't all that's important to understanding the meaning of the words and how they're operating together in the sentence. I think it's much more, use, much more useful to think of commas as kind of like screws that writers use to connect words, phrases, and clauses into larger, more complex structures. So that that little screw, and I, I think it's a good visual because the comma is really small like a screw, is what does the linking. And that's really what commas are doing. It's, they're, they're joining parts of sentences together. And that's kind of why we need pauses. It helps us break up the flow in a longer sentence, but the rules governing where the commas go are important to clarity in your writing. Your basic building block of all sentences is the independent clause, where you have a subject and a verb, and sometimes something else following that verb to complete the idea. So here's an easy example. Sam drove to the store. Okay, another example, same, similar base. Sam drove to the store and bought some ice cream. Now this is a place where I would often see a comma after store. But there really shouldn't be one because this is really just one independent clause. Sam drove to the store. It was closed. Now I have two independent clauses. Perhaps as I'm revising my writing, I think I want to be able to show a more specific relationship between these two really short sentences. I'd like to join them together. Enter the comma. Sam drove to the store, comma, but it was closed. Now I have what's called a compound sentence, two independent clauses joined together by a comma and a fanboy. Which brings us to rule number one. Use a comma and a coordinating conjunction, otherwise known as fanboys, to join two independent clauses. I wanted to go to the party. I did not finish my research paper in time. Reasonably, we can infer there's a causal relationship here, but we probably should make that very clear for our readers. So we add a comma, but. All work must be submitted on time. The teacher will not accept late assignments. Again, there's clearly a relationship here. It seems like a cause and effect relationship. While there is more than one way to join them, one possible way to do it is with a comma for. You can't just put a comma that leads to a comma splice. More on that in another video. You can't just put a for because that one little word by itself isn't strong enough to join these two independent clause building blocks, right? It needs a screw, something tighter to link those things together without them falling apart. This then brings us to our related rule, which I'm going to call 1B. If you're joining anything other than an independent, two independent clauses with fanboys, you don't use a comma. So it's the fanboys plus a comma are for independent clauses only, not every time you use fanboys. We turned up the music and began to dance. This is a simple sentence. It is one independent clause. What I sometimes see is we turned up the music, comma, and began to dance because maybe the writer has decided they want to pause here. But that's misleading to your readers because this is what it kind of means. We turned up the music, began to dance. The comma is there, and it's kind of like a screw. That means I can take it out and I can separate the parts and they can each become their own sentences again. They can stand by themselves. But began to dance 
is not a complete sentence. It's not allowed to be out there all by itself. It needs something to join to. So when we put a comma in there, we are separating it from the rest of the sentence, which is problematic because now we don't have two complete sentences. Rule number two, use commas after introductory words, phrases, and subordinate clauses. Frustrated, Ken abandoned his shopping cart instead of waiting in the long line. I could not put a comma there and it would be frustrated Ken. So kind of like an epithet or a name for him. That's probably not though what we're going for. So I need a comma. Frustrated by the long line, Ken abandoned his shopping cart. I need a comma there. It's an introductory phrase. It's worth noting here that this participial phrase could be moved to come right after Ken, and then I would have to put a comma on both sides of it. So it would read Ken, comma, frustrated by the long line, comma, abandoned his shopping cart. And finally, a clause example. Because he was frustrated by the long line, Ken abandoned his shopping cart. All three of those examples, I need to have a comma. If you need to review what phrases and clauses are, I suggest watching those videos separately or maybe going back and watching those videos before you continue this one because they'll be really helpful in understanding the comma rules. Related rule to B, when a subordinate clause comes at the end of the sentence, we don't use a comma. So this is kind of true, generally speaking, um, for subordinate clauses, specifically adverb clauses when they come at the end of the sentence. Ken abandoned his shopping cart because he was frustrated by the long line. Certainly raises the question, why not? If we're following the logic that a comma is a signal that we can take something away and still have, you know, a sentence that makes sense, wouldn't a comma work here? Yes, but that little idea, that visual of the screw is only meant to be helpful, a helpful trick, right? It's only helpful to a point. It's not really the rule itself. A lot of the comma rules have to do with guiding a reader. So while we can theoretically take away the subordinate clause, we don't need the comma to understand the sentence. Readers expect that whatever comes first in the sentence is really going to be the subject. It's the main clause. When I start by meeting readers' expectations in that way, in other words, when I start with the independent clause and I add things to the end, I often don't need commas to separate the independent clause from those things because I'm meeting reader expectations and therefore I don't need an extra signal to guide them through the sentence. Rule three, use commas to separate the items in a series. I look for my phone in the kitchen, in my bedroom, and in my purse. So I need a comma after kitchen and a comma after bedroom. Steve, Alex, and Josie baked a cake to celebrate the upcoming school break. Without a comma here, I might think Steve Alex is the person's full name. Maybe it's a compound first name, maybe it's a first name and a last name. So I need the comma if it's actually three separate people. I ordered salad, macaroni, and cheese, and chicken nuggets. That's a lot of food words. I need commas to know which ones I'm using. Here's a place to point out macaroni and cheese, because that's really a, a compound noun. Um, macaroni and cheese, that whole thing is really functioning as one word. I don't separate, I don't put an extra comma after macaroni. It's the same thing with peanut butter and jelly, spaghetti and meatballs. Something, foods that are kind of served together and known to be served together with an and, you don't separate those things with an extra comma. What about the Oxford comma? Everyone likes to ask about the Oxford comma. The Oxford comma, more generally referred to as the serial comma, is the comma before and in a series. This comma is often considered optional as long as the meaning of the sentence makes sense without it. As a side note, I personally tend to always use that comma because I feel it's safer to use it than to not use it because not using it can sometimes lead to unnecessary reader confusion. Steve, Alex, and Josie baked a cake to celebrate the upcoming school break. As we discussed a moment ago, I need a comma between Steve and Alex. Do I need the one after Alex before the and? Probably not. Steve, Alex, and Josie baked a cake. So there I could leave it out if I wanted to. I ordered salad, macaroni, and cheese, and chicken nuggets. It 
definitely need the one after salad. That's not optional. I would argue that the one after cheese is necessary here because of macaroni and cheese. We want to make it really clear that macaroni and cheese is one unit. It's not macaroni, comma, separately, cheese. It's two separate things. So putting the comma here helps make it crystal clear that that's what you need. Rule four, use a comma to separate two or more coordinate adjectives that describe the same noun. A coordinate adjective is when you have two or more adjectives of equal status that describe one noun. Um, they're coordinate because they're equal. Neither adjective is subordinate to the other. You can decide if two adjectives are coordinate by asking the following questions. Number one, does the sentence make sense if the adjectives are written in reverse order? And two, does the sentence make sense if the adjectives are written with and in between them? If you answer yes to these questions, then you most likely have coordinate adjectives and you need a comma to separate them. She was a quiet, thoughtful child. Could I say she was a thoughtful, quiet child? Yes. Could I say she was a quiet and thoughtful child? Yes. Bring in the comma. They lived in a red brick house. Could I say they lived in a brick red house? Mm, that sounds awkward. Could I say they lived in a red and brick house? Really, I couldn't do that either, so I don't use a comma. Here, brick is kind of a more important adjective than red. A brick house um, is more of the type of house, and red is and then an additional a color descriptive adjective. So they're not coordinate because they're really not equal in status. Number five, use commas to set off non-essential, also called non-restrictive, phrases and clauses from the rest of the sentence. Non-essential or non-restrictive phrases and clauses are those that provide color commentary. So they provide extra information, but that information is really just for a reader interest. It's not there to identify or restrict the noun or pronoun that's being modified by those phrases and clauses. So we're going to look at a few examples so you can understand what this means. My oldest sister, a senior history major, hopes to attend law school after graduation. Okay, so the word group in question is a senior history major. Do I need that word group to know which sister we're talking about? So let's try getting rid of it. Unscrew it. Cover it up. My oldest sister hopes to attend law school after graduation. I don't need that phrase to know which sister we're talking about. There can only be one oldest sister. That's what the est on old means. So the phrase senior history major, again, it's the color commentary, but it's not necessary to help identify which sister is being referred to. It's not restricting the sister to a particular person. It's already restricted enough by the adjective oldest. Then, of course, the inverse is also true. Do not use commas with essential or restrictive phrases and clauses. So if it's essential, you don't use it because you can't unscrew it and take it away. If the phrase or clause is necessary to specify or restrict a subgroup of people or things, then it's considered essential and should not be set off with commas. So that's, that's why I kind of like the word restrictive better than essential, because it's the idea that what makes it essential is that we need that phrase to tell us which noun, pronoun, thing, etc. is being, dis is being um, the subject of the action in the verb. So let's look at a couple examples. The students who qualified as National Merit Scholars won small scholarships. It's clear I know which students, I know who, who won small scholarships. But if I add commas, then I'm basically saying I can take that away to say the students won sco small scholarships. But that's really vague. Which students? It can't be all of them. So I really need the other information. Here's another example. Two plays by Arthur Miller are included in our high school curriculum. If I put commas around by Arthur Miller, that's a signal that I can take away that phrase and I'm not changing the meaning of the sentence. Two plays are included in our high school curriculum. That's problematic because that is changing the meaning. Probably more than two plays are included in an entire high school curriculum. Additionally, which plays, it's really vague. I need to know two plays by Arthur Miller in order for the sentence to make sense. A little more rule five. Which and that are tricky words. These are probably some of the most common comma errors that I see. Which is used to introduce non-essential adjective clauses. Which goes with non-essential. That's its job. That 
while that can do many things, one of the many things that it does is introduce essential adjective clauses. So you only use which if it's non essential, you only use that if it is essential, which means you use commas with which, but not with that. The math textbook, which is quite heavy, is more than 10 years old. If I get rid of which is quite heavy, then I still know which textbook we're talking about. The book that I borrowed from you last week is excellent. Here I need the clause that I borrowed from you last week because otherwise I just have the book is excellent. And again, that's really vague. I don't know which book we're talking about. Rule six, use commas in these conventional situations with interjections, with quotations, with specific geographical locations, and with dates. An example of an interjection. Yes, I would love to go to the party with you. Quotations. He said, don't eat my toast. I need a comma after said. Don't eat my toast, comma, he said. Here, pay, pay close attention to where the comma is placed in American English. This is not true in other countries that use English, but this is true in America. The comma goes to the left. So when it, when the, when the, um, attributive phrase comes before the quotation, the he said, then it goes outside. When it comes after, it goes inside. So basically the commas are always to the left of the quotation marks. That is not optional. That is the way that we do it. That's the convention. Specific geographical locations, Birmingham, Alabama gets its name from Birmingham, England. So I need a comma after the city and the state. I don't need one after England because it's the end of the sentence and I only need the period. And dates, I need it after the day and the year, but I don't need one between the month and the year. All right, here we are, an opportunity for a little practice. Just note that getting good at commas takes a lot of practice. Uh, many professional writers and even some editors aren't really good at this. They're easy to miss, they're easy to not hear or see. It takes a lot of concentrated effort and to be honest, sometimes, you know, the comma can be considered optional, but what I've given you here is kind of a basic overview of the most important comma rules, at least in terms the most conventional comma rules, the ones that you're most likely to need for clear writing. So here's just a little quick practice, but I do recommend doing a lot of other practice and most importantly, applying these rules to your own writing. So take a moment here to pause the video, figure out where you think commas should go. I've left all of them out. And then I'm going to go through and explain which, where commas are supposed to go and why. Number one, Amy cut the vegetables and mixed the dressing for her salad. This sentence actually is correct as it is. It doesn't take a comma. Many people would want to put a comma in after vegetables, but that would be an incorrect comma use. Because while we do have a fanboy, we're not joining two independent clauses. Instead, it's a compound verb. And you don't use a comma with the fanboy for compound verbs, only for compound sentences. Number two, farro, which is high in protein, is a healthy grain that is delicious in salads. Review what we said about which versus that. Which introduces non-essential phrases and it takes commas. That introduces essential phrases and clauses. So it does not take a comma. And if we look at the sentence and we do what we're supposed to do with it, that makes sense. So the commas tell me I can take out that group, which is high in protein, and my sentence meaning isn't changed. Farro is a healthy grain that is delicious in salads. Okay, so the which is high in protein is the color commentary. It's telling me more, but I don't need that to know which farro we're talking about. Farro is already specific enough. With healthy grain that is delicious in salads, the that is delicious in salads, I do need to help narrow the focus of the healthy grain. So that's why it's considered to be restrictive. Number three, looking forward to dinner, Alan was dismayed to see the main course was salad. Here I need a comma after dinner because that is considered an introductory element. Specifically, it's an introductory participial phrase that is not essential to the meaning of the sentence. And finally, number four, yes, I would be happy to share this recipe with you. It includes farro oranges and red peppers. So 
I need a comma after yes, because that's an interjection. I also need a comma after pharaoh, because it's not pharaoh oranges, it's pharaoh oranges and red peppers. I also included one after oranges just to make it perfectly clear, because as I said before, even though the Oxford or serial comma is technically considered optional in some cases, I personally think it's safer to use to avoid issues with lack of clarity. But I hope you found this helpful. I know it's a lot of information. You might want to go through and watch it again and do some practice and kind of go through rule by rule. But the more that you practice while applying the rules, the more that you tweak your own writing for these kinds of things, the better you're going to get at using commas correctly.